Well, because of my installation, come over here, um, Lucas. This is my good friend, Lucas Tanner. He's a pastor in South Florida in a PCA there. And because of the installation service tonight, my parents are in town, Richard and Jean Marie, but also uh, one of my very best friends in the world, uh, Lucas Tanner. And so in a lot of ways, the Lord has used him to make me a pastor because he was at our former church for uh, 10 years. And when he left, it made space for my church to bring me in as a pastor. And uh, this is a guy I've spent hours, countless hours on the phone with and just hanging out with, discerning, calling, and talking about great things. Our families are very close. He has kids our age. My, our wives are uh, good friends. So I know this isn't about him, but I just wanted to give you a sense of who this guy is. Uh, he's just a dear friend to me, and his name is Lucas Tanner. He'll be up here after he preaches to... Um, answer any questions. He right now is a pastor with RUF. We're all familiar with RUF because we support those campus minister pastors all over North Carolina. And he began a ministry at Florida Gulf Coast University five years ago, and it's, uh, it's just thriving. God is, is uh, working through him. So I'll pray for him, and then he will read the text. So, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for this great friend, this great man of God. Thank you for how you use people in each other's lives, Lord, that we are not called to walk this Christian life out alone, but you give us brothers and sisters to do that with. I pray for him right now as he would preach and read your word, Father, that truth would be spoken, that your gospel would go forth, and that lives would be changed. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Thanks, George. Good morning. It is really good to be here this morning. Uh, not a good idea to get me all emotional and choked up before I have to preach, but uh, it, it's great to be with you, um, and uh, I'm excited about this morning. I'm even more excited about this evening. Very exciting uh, time for the Sayor family and for the Meadowview family, and uh, it's an honor to, to be able to be a part of that. Uh, I have enjoyed my time here in North Carolina. My family came over the summer, and we worshiped with you all once then, and uh, it's good to be back with you. Uh, I love uh, barbecue is my favorite um, f food, so this is a good place to be for me, and I appreciate your barbecue. I appreciate your hospitality that, that you show us, that friendly North Carolina welcome, and I appreciate all the beards that I see uh, in the congregation this morning. So not a, not a lot of beards in South Florida, um, and so I appreciate that. Um, I got to just full disclosure right up, right up front before we preach. I, about a year ago when George was interviewing for the job at Metaview, I really tried to talk him out of coming here. And that, that, I just want to be honest with you up front uh, because uh, I, always, I thought that George was uh, more suited instead of being an executive pastor. I felt like George should be a senior pastor. In fact, somebody once asked me at a church, do you think George... Uh, is qualified to be a senior pastor. And I said, I've never met anyone in my life that I felt is more qualified to be a senior pastor. So when he was t told me about this church and about wanting to come here to be the executive pastor, I really tried to talk him out of that because I saw him as a senior pastor. So I'll admit I was wrong. Um, maybe that's not a good place to start before you preach to talk about being wrong. Um, but, but in my defense, I really was right. It, only, it took, about a, uh, took about a year to come to fruition, but at the end of the day, I was, I was right about that. And so before I preach, I just want you to know, it might take a year for this message to really come to fruition in your own life. But sit tight. All right. Our scripture passage this morning is a story that maybe you're familiar with. It's uh, the story of the woman at the well can be found in John's Gospel, the fourth chapter. Uh, you have a, a chair Bible that it, look, it looks like this. Um, if, you want, if you're using the chair Bible, it's on page 888. Uh, you can turn there. If uh, you're visiting this morning and perhaps you don't uh, have a Bible at home, um, I'm told that you're allowed to take this Bible home, that it's a gift from Meadowview to you. So uh, don't be... Uh, uh, embarrassed about doing that. If you don't have a Bible at home, take that with you. So page 888, John uh, chapter 4, and I'll be reading uh, verses 1 to verse uh, 29. 
verses 1 to 29. Listen carefully as I read, because this is God's Word. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize, but only his disciples, he left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria, so he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, so Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to draw water. Jesus said to her, Give me a drink, for his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us the well and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such people to worship him. God is spirit, and those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming, he who is called Christ. When he comes, he will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman. But no one said, what do you seek, or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, Come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? The grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of our God stands forever. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word that stands forever. Your word that is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray, Lord, that your word would cut us this morning, not to wound, but like a doctor's scalpel to heal. Lord, speak to us now through your word by the power of your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As George said, I'm the... Uh, the campus minister for Reformed University Fellowship at Florida Gulf Coast University. It's a work uh, that we started uh, about four and a half years ago. And we recently celebrated our four-year house anniversary. Have you heard that word this before? House anniversary? Now, it's a real word. I didn't make it up. You, you can look it up, Google it. It's actually, it's a combination of two words, house and anniversary. 
and it's the anniversary of the day that you moved in to your home. And for us, four years ago, that was a really big deal uh, because this is the first time we've ever lived in a home that we purchased. Uh, I'd lived in church parsonages my whole adult life, and so uh, we were very excited. And I remember uh, very vividly when we went to see the home for the very first time. I remember vividly for a few reasons. One, I really had to go to the bathroom. And apparently, you're not supposed to use a bathroom in a, in a home that you're, you're visiting. But I just had to go, and so I did. And, uh, I, well, I guess I sort of marked my territory because we ended up getting that home. So I remember it for that reason. I remember it because it had a swimming pool. And my kids really wanted a swimming pool in South Florida. And uh, we, just, we just thought that that was going to be way out of our price range. And so we had tried to prepare our kids that we wouldn't be getting a pool. But some sweet lady from the church told our kids that she was going to pray that God gave us a swimming pool. And I was mad with, at her for getting my kids' hopes up like that. So I remember that we were so surprised when we saw the pool. And then... The third reason I remember that day so vividly is because my wife was really upset with me because she absolutely loved the home and it was out of our price range quite significantly. And when we got in the car and we shut the door, I was so happy and I looked over at her and she said, why did you bring me here? Why did you show me this house? Because it was so much better than the homes that we uh, had been looking at. But long story short, we, we put in our very best offer and uh, both uh, realtors worked with the seller uh, to make sure uh, that we got into the home uh, for a, a price that was much cheaper than the asking price. And we were very thankful. It's, always, it's the home that I always imagined that I'd live in when I was a boy. It's been four years, and we're thankful for it every day. We still love it. It's in a great neighborhood. Well, it's a mostly great neighborhood. People speed up and down the street, but that's not that big. It's really nothing. Uh, it would be nice to have another bedroom. It's a three-two. It's a three-two. We have three kids. The girls share a room. It's not that big of a deal. It's starting to get a little crowded in there, but I would, wouldn't mind if it had an extra room for a study. The yard, it's kind of on the small side, but that's because there's a swimming pool in the backyard. So we don't have a lot of room to play in the yard, but the kids love the pool. It is a saltwater pool, which is, I, I'm told is better for your skin and your eyes, but it, man, it really is a pain to maintain. And it's a two-car garage. Uh, we have one car, but I can't imagine fitting two cars in there. I guess if you took out all the, the stuff that you keep in your garage, you could maybe possibly fit a couple small, compact electric cars in the garage, but certainly not two cars. And sometimes I just, I just wonder what people were, th what the builders were thinking. I mean, our laundry room is right in the middle of the house. There's no way that we can, we can vent the dryer anyway, but up through the ceiling and out the back of the house. It's really, it's really unusual. I just wonder what they were thinking sometimes. Okay, it's been four years and the magic has faded. I'll be honest. And truthfully, full disclosure, sometimes, I'll confess, sometimes late at night when my wife and kids are asleep, I'll be in the living room on my phone scrolling through images of other houses <laughs> on Zillow. And the search continues. Why do we do that? Something comes along in our lives and we think, oh, this is it. This is the one. Maybe, maybe you can relate to that. Maybe there's been a time in your life, maybe you moved into a new home that, that had a great neighborhood and great schools and you thought, this is it. This is the one. Maybe you purchased a new car. You're finally able to ditch the minivan. Your kids got a little older. You got to get rid of the minivan and you finally got the car that you always wanted your whole adult life. Maybe you, maybe it wasn't something like a home or a car. Maybe you got a new outfit or a new hairstyle. 
and you thought, this is it. This is the look. Maybe you got a new job, a better company, you made a higher salary with better perks. Maybe you got into another relationship with someone who treated you better or someone you had more in common with. Maybe you found, who knows, maybe you found a new church. Maybe you found this church, and it had better worship and nicer people. I mean, you all seem nice. And maybe when any of those things happened, you thought, yes, this is it. I have finally arrived. And it was great for a time until that new car smell wore off, until those imperfections surfaced, or until that new hairstyle started growing out. And then you begin to think, this, this house, this new job, this new relationship, this, this just isn't everything that I thought it was going to be. And so your search continues. And you look, and you look, and you look. But what are you looking for? What are we looking for? Because nothing ever really seems to satisfy our thirst, does it? Here's the big idea this morning. Jesus is the one you're looking for. That's it. That's the big idea that I'll be talking about. Jesus is the one that you're looking for. When our passage, when our story begins, Jesus and his disciples are heading north into Galilee. And there were really two possible routes from Judea into Galilee. And the shorter of the two was through Samaria. And this area of Samaria had been the heart of Israel's northern kingdom until about 722 B.C. when the Assyrians conquered it and deported most of its people. And Jesus travels through this area, this area of Samaria, on his journey from Judea to Galilee. And it was around noon. Your, our Bible says it was around the sixth hour. And hours back then were counted from sunrise to sunset, and so six hours after sunrise is around noon. And Jesus is traveling. It's the middle of the day. It's the Middle East. It's hot. I mean, I've heard it can get hot here in North Carolina in the summer. Am I right? In South Florida in the summertime, I don't even like to walk from my house out to my car. And here, let alone walk from Judea to Galilee. And here's Jesus in the middle of the day, in the Middle East. It's hot and he is tired. And so he stops to rest at Jacob's well. Now the interesting thing is that well is still here today. You can, you can look it up on Google. Google Maps. Look it up. It's great. It's next to an auto parts store. I'm not lying. It, it really is. So while Jesus is resting there at the well next to the auto parts store, a Samaritan woman comes to draw water. Now, things are about to get really, really awkward. You see, after the Assyrians conquered Samaria in 722, the Israelites who didn't get deported intermarried with foreigners who had been relocated into that region from other parts of the Assyrian Empire. And as a result of their intermarriage with these foreigners, a new people group formed called the Samaritans. And because they were the children of the Israelites' intermarriage with, foreign, with foreigners, the Samaritans lost their distinctly Israelite identity. Now, they still worshipped Yahweh, but they used a shorter version of the Bible and they worshipped on a different mountain. They worshipped on Mount Gerizim instead of in Jerusalem. And the Jews despised Samaritans. They hated them for religious reasons, for ethnic reasons. They didn't consider them to be a part, a true part of the Jewish community. And the feeling was mutual. The Samaritans felt the same way about the Jews that the Jews felt about them. 
And so what was Jesus going to do? He meets this Samaritan. But on top of that, this is a Samaritan woman. Not only did the Jews avoid contact with Samaritans, but Jewish men avoided speaking with women in public. Even their own wives. They wouldn't speak to their own wives in public. And I've seen this when I'm out to eat at restaurants. I've seen men not speaking to their own wives while they're eating dinner. But this was more than that. This was a Samaritan woman. What will Jesus do? This is really awkward. So what does Jesus do? Well, he, he talks to her. And we're not surprised by that. Because we're modern Americans, right? We're into kindness and tolerance. And, and so this doesn't surprise us at all. But you have to understand that the original audience would have been shocked by this. In fact, if you look down at verse 27, it says the disciples marveled that he was speaking to this Samaritan woman. And not only would the original readers have been shocked, and the disciples were shocked, but the woman herself is surprised that Jesus is talking to her. In verse 9, she asks him, How is it? That you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a, a woman of Samaria. In other words, why are you paying attention to me? What's your agenda? You shouldn't be talking to me. Why are you paying attention to me? But Jesus responds in verse 10 and tells her, you need to be paying attention to me. You see, Jesus knows why this woman is there. And you read the passage, and I read the passage, and we think, well, of course he knows why she's there. It's a well. She's obviously there to get water. But Jesus knows something deeper that's going on with this woman. Jesus knows what she's looking for. Jesus knows what we're all looking for. That, that search, that longing, that looking, that thirst, he knows that. And to that search and to that longing, he tells her and he tells us, I am the source of never-ending water. And when he tells her that, she says, that's it. That's what I want. I don't want to be thirsty anymore. You see, this woman is thirsty She's looking for something. She's looking for something to take away her thirst. Something that will satisfy the deepest longings of her heart. But nothing seems to be working. So she comes back to this place again and again and again. And she doesn't want to keep coming back. But she keeps finding herself in the same place, driven here, by the same insatiable thirst. Her life is captured in this trip to the well. She doesn't want to keep coming to this well. She says that in verse 15. In fact, she hates coming to this well. And this is a picture of her life. Can you relate to that? Have you ever found yourself in that place or in a place like that? Have you ever found yourself in your own life thinking, here I go again? What am I doing? I hate this. I hate that I keep doing this. I hate that I keep finding myself here. I can't keep doing this. I can't keep coming here. I have to stop, but I can't stop. And that's why this woman says to Jesus, give me that water which will keep me from coming back to this well. And Jesus says, if you want that water, bring me your husband. Now that, that is a really odd request for Jesus. And she responds to him, I don't have a husband. Yikes! 
This is like one of those, you know, open your mouth, insert your foot. Doesn't it seem like one of those moments? Bring me your husband. I don't have a husband. <laughs> Reminds me of the time when I was in high school and I ruined Thanksgiving. We had a, we had a fam, our, all our family was together at our house. We were having a wonderful Thanksgiving meal together. And I asked one of my younger cousins, he was probably about seven or eight years old, just joking, having fun, just asked him if he had a girlfriend. And he immediately started to cry and cry loudly. And pretty soon the adult table noticed that there was a commotion going on in the other room. And so they came over and he's crying and my aunt Laura comes over and she's trying to console him and hold him and, and, and find out what's going on. But he's, too, he's crying too much. She can't understand what he's saying. And so I just tell her, I, just, I don't know what happened. I just asked him if he had a girlfriend. Well, it turns out he really did have a girlfriend, a seven or eight year old type of girlfriend. And she had died, tragically. And I had no idea. And in just in fun, I I just asked. I didn't know. Is that what's happening here? Is Jesus like ignorant 15-year-old me? No, absolutely not. Jesus knows He knows all about her life. He doesn't say anything by mistake or in ignorance. He knows about her love life. He tells her about her love life. He tells her, you've had five husbands. And that doesn't include the man that you're with now. You see, this woman had been with one man after another. Maybe it's because of death that she'd had this many husbands. Maybe it was because of divorce that she had this many husbands. Maybe it was because of promiscuity. We really don't know. But here's what I want you to notice. When Jesus tells her about her love life, he's not condemning her. And this is so important. What Jesus is doing is not shaming her. Jesus is going right to her heart. He's inviting her gently, full of grace, mercy, and compassion, and love for this woman. He's taking her by the hand, and he's taking her to a deep place in her heart and soul that maybe she's never gone before, and he's going with her to that place. C.S. Lewis, in his, in his book, Mere Christianity, said that most people if they really learned to look into their own hearts, they would know that they want something that can't be had in this world. If people could learn to look into their own hearts, they'd learn that they want something that can't be had in this world. And there's all kinds of things in this world, he says, that offer to give that to you, but they never quite keep their promise. Lewis says, If I find in myself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy, the most logical explanation, the most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. Blaise Pascal wrote about this craving. He said, what else does this craving proclaim but that there was once in man a true happiness, all of which that now remains is the empty print and trace. And man tries in vain to fill it with everything around him. But nothing can help, he wrote. Because this infinite abyss can only be filled with an infinite and immutable object, in other words, by God himself. Augustine, that great African theologian, wrote, you have made us for yourself Oh God, and our hearts are restless until they rest in you. We've been made for God to know him, to love him, to have a relationship with him. And yet we look for God in a thousand other places. And none of those ever places ever satisfy the deep longings of our hearts because we're longing for God. 
The Bible puts it this way. You might have caught it as we read it in, the conf- in our uh, confession of sin this morning. Did you catch it? In Jeremiah 2.13, God says, My people have sinned in two ways. They've deserted me, even though I'm the spring of water that gives life. That's the first way that they've, des- they've deserted me, the spring of living water. And then they've dug their own wells. And this is what God says in Jeremiah 2 about those wells. Those wells are broken. And they can't hold water. You see what God is saying? You need what you're looking for. And what you need is a spring of living water. And God says, I'm the spring of living water. But look at you. Here you are at this well. You're trying to get water from these other sources. And here's the thing. All those other sources are broken. So let me ask you this morning, what is your broken well? It's different for you than it is for me. What is that source that you keep running to in your life? For this woman, I said it, as I said before, it may have been men. Again, this is some speculation here. I mean, this is an odd time for a woman to come to get water from a well. She's there. She's alone. That's another odd fact. She kind of assumes that Jesus is propositioning her. Again, there's some speculation, but perhaps this woman, the source that she was running to was men. Maybe she thought, if I could just find the right guy then everything would be okay. What is that for you? Take out the word guy. If I just had blank, then everything in my life would be okay. I'd be satisfied with my life if I just had blank. What is that blank for you? You know, if I just had a six-figure salary, all my problems would go away. Things would be okay. If I just had a stable marriage, if I just had a good family, if my kids, if I just had successful kids, then I could feel good about my life. What is it? If I just had success or honor or love or looks, what is that blank that you think will satisfy you? What do you run to to satisfy you? When you're anxious, where do you go to take away your anxiety? When you're sad or angry or stressed or in pain, where do you run for rest and freedom? I'm an emotional eater. That means uh, I eat when I'm stressed. But when I'm sad, see, I eat when I'm sad too. (laughs) Unless I'm angry, then if I'm angry, well, then I I eat when I'm angry too. The, The problem is all these unwanted behaviors just bring about more negative feelings of guilt and shame and despair, don't they? The things we're trying to escape from In that escape, we feel more shame and more guilt and more despair. And I end up like that morbidly obese Scottish henchman from the movie Austin Powers 2, who said this famous deep theological quote, I eat because I'm unhappy, and I'm unhappy because I eat. It's a vicious cycle. It's like a thirsty person drinking seawater. It only leads to a greater thirst and a more severe dehydration. And so Jesus, out of love and compassion, says to this woman, if you want life-giving water, 
you must bring me your husband. And that's it. You have to bring Jesus your broken well. You have to bring Jesus that dream. Whatever that thing is that you think will make everything in your life okay, you have to bring that dream to him and give it to him. Or that device, that thing that you escape to, you have to bring that to Jesus. You have to bring him your broken well. And at this point, the woman says to him, because she's just blown away by what Jesus is doing in her heart, that she says, Sir, I perceive that you're a prophet. And so, because you know stuff. You see stuff. You see and hear. Since you're a prophet, I've got a question that's always bothered me about worship. And at this point, you may have thought that this woman was changing the subject. And you may have thought that at this point in the story, we're all over the map. But this conversation really isn't all over the map. You see, this conversation really is all about worship. She wanted to talk about where you worship, but Jesus wants to talk about what you worship. What do you look to to satisfy you? And that is what you worship. That's what idolatry is. You know, it's like Jesus in the New Testament, he's having that conversation and people think that money is just going to fix all their problems. And Jesus, in response to that type of thinking, says, well, you can't worship God and money. He sees it as a matter of worship and service. Idols aren't little statues of gold or silver. Idols are are what we look to, to satisfy. This is all about worship. What are you looking to, to satisfy you? To bring your life meaning and purpose and value. This woman, in response to Jesus, says, well, I I guess we won't really know until the Messiah comes. When, When the Messiah comes, he'll reveal God to us. Now, Messiah means anointed one, and the Messiah was the person that the Jews and the Samaritans had been looking forward to. He's the one, remember in in Genesis, when God made Adam and Eve and all of creation and everything was good, And human beings lived in perfect fellowship with God. And then sin entered the world and it ruined everything. And right after sin entered the world in Genesis 3.15, God promises the Messiah. God promised to send someone who would fix it and make everything okay. The Messiah was a figure of salvation who would save God's people. He'd bring judgment upon God's enemies And he would rule over the nations perfectly. He'd make everything right. And she says, that's who we're looking for. When he comes, when Messiah comes, he'll explain everything. She tells Jesus, when the Messiah comes, he'll sort out all this mess. She tries to tell Jesus, when the Messiah comes, everything will be okay. She tries to tell Jesus... And Jesus says, I am he. I am the Messiah. It's one of the few times that Jesus openly proclaims who he is as the Messiah of God's people. I, he's telling her, I am the one that you're looking for. I'm the one that everyone is looking for. That desire that's in each of you for something to make everything be okay. It's a longing for the Messiah. And Jesus says, I'm he. I'm the one you're looking for. And I want you to notice something very, very important. 
Look at verse 28. It's so, it seems so small and so insignificant that you probably missed it. In verse 28, we're told that when this woman begins to see Jesus as the one she's been looking for, she leaves her water jar. And that's it. Until you see Jesus as the one you're looking for. Until you see Jesus as the only one who can satisfy the deepest longings of your heart, you'll never be able to leave your water jar. You'll never be able to walk away from that broken well until you see Jesus. And that's what that great hymn says. That great hymn says, what can strip the seeming beauty from the idols of the earth? Not a sense of right or duty, but the sight of peerless worth. What can pull you away from that idol? It's not a sense of duty. It's not willpower. It's not logical thinking that will pull you away from that idol. It is the sight of peerless worth. It is seeing Jesus. Until you see Jesus as the fulfillment of all your deepest longings for comfort and joy and security and hope and pleasure, you'll never ever be able to leave and walk away from or let go of your addiction to food, to alcohol, to pornography, to new things, to new homes and new cars and new jobs and new outfits and new hairstyles until you see Jesus. And when she does, she leaves her water jar because she has found a spring of living water. And then she goes home and she tells all of her friends, come and see a man who told me all that I ever did. Really? All that you ever did? I mean, according to this story, he did tell her that she had five husbands. And the man that she's with now isn't her husband, but all she ever did? How could she say that? She's saying this. Come see a man who looked into my soul and told me things about myself that even I didn't know. And Jesus will still do that today. Jesus will still look into your soul and tell you things about yourself that even you didn't know. He will expose your broken wells. He will show you your idols. Not to condemn you, friends, but because he loves you and because he wants to satisfy you. And maybe he's doing that this morning. He still does it and maybe he's doing it this morning. Maybe Jesus is doing that with some of you. Maybe he's showing you things about yourself that even you didn't know. Maybe this morning Jesus Christ in his mercy and grace is taking you by the hand into the deepest, darkest places of your heart and soul that you try to avoid and not think about. Maybe he's doing it with you now. Do you know this Jesus? Do you know his soul satisfying love or are you still looking for him in a thousand other places friend you can know his love today from right, right where you are in just a minute when we go in prayer go to the father bring him your broken well and tell him that you believe that only he can satisfy. Thomas Chalmers 
the well-known Scottish preacher said in, his, in this famous sermon. Seldom do any of our habits or flaws disappear by a process of extinction through reasoning or by the f- mere force of mental determination. He said reason and willpower are not enough. But what cannot be destroyed can be dispossessed. He said, the only way to dispossess the heart of an old affection is by the expulsive power of a new one. In other words, the only way to loosen your heart's grip on your idols is to bring those idols, those broken wells, to Jesus. And bring them to him again and again and again. And begin to see Jesus as the one that you're searching for. And slowly, but surely, over time, your heart will begin to loosen its grip on those idols. Won't you begin doing that today? Won't you do that now? What's keeping you from bringing those to him now? Let's bring those to him in prayer. Let's pray.